and I'm Dave Hardy, Secretary of Revenue, and of course Mark Miko, my Deputy Secretary, is here with me. And the Governor wanted me to let, you know, let everybody know it's five minutes out and to make a couple of preliminary comments about the tax plan. So if everybody can come in and socially distance and get settled down, we'll, we'll talk about his plan, but I'll save the thunder for him, okay? Uh, a lot of people ask us, ask me and ask Mark, how did we help the governor come up with this plan? And it was pretty simple. He came to us and he said, I, want, I have three or four goals in mind. Number one, this was the day after the election in November. Number one, I want a flat state budget. I don't want to cut services. I don't want to go in. I don't want to cut services for children. I don't want to cut law enforcement. I don't want to make any cuts in the budget. Well, that was our first goal. Don't cut the current budget. The state's budget is $4,574,000,000. Million million. This year, the budget we put in is $4,569,000,000. Million million. So we did cut the state's budget by about $4 million this year, which is essentially flat. And that's the governor's goal. The part of this plan, everybody's focused on the revenue side, but the expense side is important too. And that is to keep the, the budget flat for the next three years. That is not easy to do. It's a lot harder than it sounds. To give you an idea, a 1% cut in the state budget is $45 million. Just 1%. So to keep it even, uh, inflation every year grows a little bit. So you have to work very hard to keep that budget tight. That was our first goal. Our second goal was that he wanted a... 60%, and originally the idea was 50%. Then he decided to go with 60%. A 60% cut in the state income tax in the first year. Now, your math on that is this. The state income tax generates about $2.1 billion a year. 60% of that, roughly, when we did the math, uh, when we took what we did, we took out part of the income. We did. We decided that for the first year we were not going to get into uh, cutting business uh, schedule C income and that type of income. We focused on wages, salaries, social security, and pensions. And this plan cuts the income tax on wages, salaries, social security, and pensions by 60%. That is $1,035,000,000. That's a big number. Then, last goal. He said, the governor said to Mark and me, I don't want any West Virginian to get hurt. I don't want anybody at the lower income levels in our state to lose money and to have less money in their pocket on this cut of the state income tax. So what we did, we broke down all the households in West Virginia. Here's a trivia question. How many households are there in West Virginia? According to the United States Census Service, there's 732,000 households in West Virginia. It's surprising there are a very large number of households that have income of less than $10,000, less than $20,000, less than $30,000. The way we designed this plan, any household that has an income of less than $35,000 gets a rebate from our state income tax. So not only did we cut the state income tax for the lower households, the ones making $35,000 or less, we also have a plan, and the government will explain that plan on this board right here, where those folks get on top of the income tax cut, they get an extra rebate which made this plan cash positive for every household in West Virginia, all 732,000 households. The cost of that is $52 million. So if you take the tax cut, $1 billion, $35 million, and you take the $52 million rebate, we are at this plan, and the governor just arrived, I'm gonna turn it over to him, this plan puts $1,087,000,000 million back into the hands of West Virginians in its first year. And that being said, that's, that's the big number, that's the wow factor that has been referenced by others. I'm gonna turn this over to our friend, Governor Jim Justice. Governor.
Stay in your lane. You know, exit a thousand feet. Nope, here it is. <laughs> but uh, nevertheless, thank you for playing on days. Thank you for, you know, the words I'm sure that he's given us. I want to answer your questions in just a second, but uh, let me just tell you this, this. You know, there's a bunch of naysayers, and anytime we have change, it's tough. You know, the, uh, the biggest thing that I hope you'll focus on is one thing, and it's just this, is, uh, you know, I, I, I ran for election, then I ran for re-election, and with all that, just to tell it like it is, it'd been easy, it'd have been easy to just say, tell you what, let's do, West Virginia is leading the nation in the COVID support and all that kind of stuff. Our economics are phenomenal compared to the first day that I walked through the door. So let's just take a victory lap. And to stay in the state, let's just do that. But you see, the real, the reality of the whole thing is just this. We that supposedly are supposed to serve, that's not what we're supposed to do. You know, Really true, we don't need to ride the floats and wave to people. We don't need to do that. Unfortunately, like it or not like it, you know, you've got a ton of politicians that as soon as they get through running, they're running again. Well, that's not me. You know, I drive myself. I don't take a salary, I, don't take, I, I, I feed myself, I feed the troopers, I do everything I possibly can, but literally, whether you believe it or don't believe it, I'm here for one reason, and that's to serve. And with all that, I am telling you, we've done very, very, very well. But now let's just be brutally fair again, okay? My predecessors did things like we got rid of prevailing wage, we passed right to work, we did things, we did things before I ever got there. In hopes that people would really come. And we lost population. And then I came along, like it or not like it, it's just fact. You know, I had a lot of great people around me. I just saw one of them right back there, Austin Caperton, who was an incredible superstar. You know, a lot of great people were right around me. And we passed Roads to Prosperity. We did all kinds of stuff for education. We did stuff for events, the elderly. We absolutely produced surplus after surplus. We handled the pandemic unbelievably. We got absolutely knocked it out of the park economically and everything else. And they still don't come. Now, let's just, let's just be real grown -up. Real ground. You know, I am telling you, we have laid the groundwork for a lot, a lot, a lot of goodness. We really have. Everything is right in front of us, right in front of us for the table. Now, it's our time. It's our time. And you get groups, and not to throw mud at any of the groups, but you get groups to come out and say, you know, we're not for this because we think this will hurt small business. It's the dumbest thing in the world. It's the dumbest thing on the planet. That's all we There's no other way to say it. And I'm going to prove to you exactly how that is not a very smart thing. You've got groups that come out and say, well, we're going to put all this on the burden of the people that are struggling the most, the low income wage earners. It's not true again. It's just not true. Now, I'm depending on you to have open minds and just think. Just really think. We have other people that are out there saying, no, other people won't come. There's nobody that will really come. Well, we don't know that, do we? We don't really know that. And that could be argumentative. I think they'll come in avalanches. You may think they'll only come just a little bit, but nobody can deny that they won't, there won't be one person come. Now, today, nobody will deny this too. West Virginia, the only red state. And if you 
want to be the only state to be dead last, we got that down pat. We got it down pat how to be last. The only state in the nation, in a nation where the population doubled, doubled since 1950. What would have happened if we would have doubled the population? You know how many people we have in West Virginia right now? 4.4 million people. We've got a million seven and change. If we had 4.4 million people, do you honestly not think that our roads, our schools, everything, our businesses, our property values, our home back, do you not think everything would be better? Of course it would. Of course it would. Man, the only state in the nation, the population's gone down. It's amazing. The closest to us has grown 20%. Isn't that right? Isn't it, isn't it? The closest. The closest to last. We're so far last, we can't even see the finish line. Now, think about this just a second. What's the plan then? If this isn't the plan, what's the plan? You can't tell me that. I've not heard that from anybody. Now, let me go through this. Here's what we, we did, and we worked, and gosh, I mean, this is this is the whole thing, the whole problem with all this job, and it's just this, it takes a lot of work. I mean, this job is work all the time, and, one, and you tweak, and you tweak, and you work, and you work, and you keep at it, and at it, and at it, and just stay at it. Now, stay with me a second. We've got this now. Through every income bracket, every bracket, everybody stays cash positive. Everybody. No matter who you are. No matter even if you're not paying income taxes. Everybody stays cash positive. Cash positive. Cash, cash positive. Now, how do we do that? <clears throat> for the people that aren't paying income taxes, like the under 10000 we give them a check for $350. And then we model out how much are they going to spend on the increase in, in sales tax, or how much are they going to spend, you know, on cigarettes or liquor or soda pop or whatever, all the way across, and we come to a number, and the number is $250 or whatever it may be to the good. For the lowest income, and as it goes up, it just gets better and better and better and better. So, on one hand, let's say it's the left hand, what you've got to decide is, do we want our people to have more money? Because they're going to all have more money. And if you say no, then I think you've got a screw loose. That's all there's to it. Now, on the other hand, you've got to say, do we think there's going to be more opportunity happening in West Virginia for this? Meaning that Property values will go up, more people will move here, wages will go up, more jobs. Do we really think that? Well, I absolutely, I, I, I can't imagine anybody not thinking that. Now, if you had a third hand, because of whatever it may be, you know, if you had a third hand, you would say, is this going to hurt the state of West Virginia? <clears throat> and we've got that right on the moon. There's no way. There's no way. If we do this right here, no way. It's a complete balance. There's no way. No way. Now, here's what I want you to do. I want you just to open your minds and think of one thing, one thing alone. And, and Dave Hardy just touched on this. I want you to throw away everything I said. Throw it all in the trash can. And just think of one thing and one thing alone. There's 732,585 households in West Virginia today. The average household, the average household will receive checks because the way we'll do it is this way. You know, like Rick, if Rick were working for me and he's getting a paycheck every two weeks, we're going we're to have him pay the same amount of taxation that he's paying right now. We're not going to change anything 
But every quarter, we're going to send him a check for his money back. So we're going to send him checks. Not just cash rebate checks. We're going to send him checks. If Rick's making $100,000, we're going to send him checks for, for $600 every three months. We're going to just send him a check. Now, like I said, throw it all away. Throw it all away. But now let's just be fair. We're going to send those households 732,585. We're going to send every one of those households $1,483 a year as an average. Every one of them. Now, do you think they're going to buy, buy more than Chick-fil-A sandwiches for Richard? Do you think they're absolutely going to do more stuff by, by, you know, upgrade their insurance? Do you think they're not going to spend their money? I mean, there is no way. Honest to goodness, it is a billion, eighty-seven million dollars. They're going to buy more soda pop. They're going to buy more tobacco. They're going to buy more dresses at the dress store. They're going to buy more stuff at Walmart. They're going to see the accountants more. They're going to see the lawyers more. They're going to do everything more. It will be the biggest stimulus package that you could ever fathom, and it will happen every year, every year, every year. Doesn't have anything to do with making them all cash positive. Doesn't have anything to do with the opportunity. Doesn't have anything to do with making the state hold. It has only one thing to do, and that's money, money, money. In all the hands of our people, and every one of us will be scrambling to get more and more and more of the billion, 90, uh, 87 million dollars. Richard will advertise more. You know, we have our television station, our radio station worried about their advertising. Are you kidding me? Are you kidding? You know, there's no way. And you know what? As we get rid of the other 40%, that almost double. That over there will almost double going into the hands of everybody. Now, you talk about people being penny wise and pound poor. People just didn't understand. They didn't get it. They just didn't understand. It is our biggest chance in the history of the universe. And there is nobody that's going to convince me to the contrary. It is absolutely our chance to propel our businesses beyond belief in all businesses, in every aspect. You see, the thing you better be concerned about is just this. COVID will leave. Stimulus will leave. Then what are you going to do? What are you going to do? The odds are that our natural resources are going to probably play a lesser role than even they play today. What are we going to do? Especially what are you going to do in Southern West Virginia? Right after that, you're going to be a state park. This is a chance, a chance beyond all imagination. Now ask me something. Ask me anything. Please, please don't be shy, because you're not going to hurt my feelings. Ask me anything, and I'll have the very best of my ability. Come on now. Ask me something. I'm waiting on you.
and we bring in a lot of tax dollars for tourism. And uh, I moved here four years ago with my family from North Carolina to reinvest in the state. I raised my three kids here, and uh, it's just it's going to be a big hit. Okay, let, let me let me address this. Okay, along the way we did town halls, just virtually, and when we were doing the town halls. You know, I was trying to tell the people from the standpoint of tobacco and soda pop, you know, really true. There's two things that, that are pretty, pretty much argued on an awful lot that, you know, the soda pop may be hurting our kids a little bit, and the tobacco sure it hurts, you know. And, and then people were right in constantly saying, well, what about beer, wine, and women? You got to put them with them. And so we ended up, we did that. We just put them with them. I would tell you this with all in me, from the beer standpoint, just a beer, just a beer standpoint. We're talking about 10 cents a can. Forget the 483% increase and all that. We're talking 10 cents a can, man. And, and in the state of Tennessee and other states and everything, they're higher than us. But now getting higher than what we propose. But I want you to know this. I really, I really and truly, you know, expect somebody on the other side to say, that's too high. Let's do a third of that. You know, that's too high. And I'd be great with that. I'm not stuck in the mud on any piece of it being exactly what it is because everybody just sat on their hands and waited on me to come with something. And what I tried to do was just spread it out all over everybody and everything. But really and truly, Am I stuck in the mud on it being $20 or whatever it is, you know, versus it being $6? Of course not. You know, I want your business to thrive in every way. Every way. I just want us to all, but, but, I, but I, I really do think this. And this is the part that probably I'm going to have a difficult time convincing you of this right now. But I bet you all the money in Texas right now that if you did exactly what I wanted to do, you'd sell one and a half times as much beer as you're selling today. And the reason I say that is because everybody out there is going to have all this money. Where are they going to, what are they going to do with me? Well, I, I know, uh, albeit Alaska is the only one in the 50th state that would be higher than the 29-25, but the closest one that we found even closer here is, you know, Virginia, six bucks and some change. So that's, that's a big difference to take it up that high. And, um, you know, there's 28 breweries here. And I would guess, you know, a lot of them are on the Virginia border, Pennsylvania border. And if this hits, you know, a lot of them feel like they're going to have to move out of state for their production. So it's just a big concern for well, a lot of us. Well, here we are. I don't care if we lessen it significantly. I'm okay. I'm perfectly fine, okay? But I want you to understand, too, that you take a convenience store that's right on the borderline between two states. How's a convenience store making it today? You know, everything in that convenience store, from the beer to the toilet paper to everything in that convenience store, I could go to Walmart and buy a whole lot cheaper. You know, everything. It's a convenience store. It has a name. It's a convenience store. But you will never convince me that if you give all the people around you that much money that we're talking about giving them, that they're giving them, giving them that they're not going to buy everything in a convenience store more than what they're buying today. And that's what you've got to really factor in. I mean, the bottom line, if you want to stay right where you're at, don't do it. Don't do anything. Well, if it lessens, you know, then that's more manageable for us. But if it stays the same, then it, it just trickles down to the retailer, especially, right? Like if they're going to go in and buy a weather ground beer, if the tax, we have to sell higher to the restaurant or the account, and then they have to move forward and sell higher to the customer. And so if it stays where it is right now at the, you know, $29.25 for us, it's not feasible for us to go and sell our beer to a local account and then the account charged twelve to fourteen dollars a pint. No one's going to buy that. So for us, it's twelve to fourteen dollars more a pint. Yeah, because the craft the craft beer is already higher than the Michelob and the Coors Light of the world, and then oh, okay. they now have I to then they have to add on because we have to charge them more. 
to buy the keg, so then it, it goes exponentially out, out the roof for us. So, Dave, you've done all kinds of studies on just that right there. Show them what, you, show what you've got. And I don't mean to take up all the time. So. Well, somebody else get ready to ask something, please. Yeah, the uh, 
With, with respect to the consumer sales tax, the highest one in the country when you add in state and local is Tennessee. Tennessee is at 9.55%. Our, under this proposal, our, our average rate in West Virginia would be 8.4% for a consumer sales tax. So we're 1.1% below Tennessee. Tennessee, of course, has no state income tax. Uh, but however, when you look at states like Tennessee, they tend to tax other consumer things and, and consumption taxes. But the, the takeaway is when you put a billion, 87 million more dollars in people's hands to spend, they spend it. So you get a lot more revenue in general from all those tax sources and also there's a lot more personal choice involved and that you're choosing to, buy, to purchase all these different things whether it be alcohol. Then of course a lot of our analysis assumes people don't use alcohol, don't use tobacco, might drink a soft drink. In many of our charts we factored in a household that might have a lower income but they would only be affected by the fact that they drink soft drinks, that they don't use tobacco or e-cigarettes or any of that stuff. And they also come out even further ahead because they choose not to use the alcohol products or the beer products or the cigarette products. But, but you, I don't think you're answering exactly. Yeah. On, on the tax compared to other, other states, just tell him like our our beer tax per gallon or our wine tax per gallon or whatever it is. You know, that was just done, that was comparing a gallon in Tennessee and a gallon here and whatever. Is your question about all alcohol or just beer? I'm just saying when you go into a, any store, a convenience store, a restaurant, if you bought alcohol, you know, are those states that you're saying that are higher than, than the one she was proposing was, are they charging an additional alcohol tax on top of regular sales tax? You mean like in West Virginia where we have a 5% tax? It varies from state to state. It, there's no consistent approach on that at all. But so, to answer you, Rich, in, in Tennessee, you know, let's just do Tennessee or Alaska, where they're charging, you know, we isolated them, at least I think I did, you know, we did, we isolated them that they are charging more on the alcohol tax than we would be charging. That's correct. You know, and, and to give you an example, like our, our wine that we put in is $4 a gallon, and it works back to a 94 cents a bottle, and we're too high on it. And I know we're too high, you know, and and that's something that we need to we need to whittle down, you know. And but uh, but you got to understand. I want you to always just understand. I mean, listen. Every one of you can go to church on Sunday and listen to the minister. I want you to get the message. Even if the great Dan Anderson is up here preaching, I want you to listen to his message. And every last one of us can go and find something that Dan says we don't like. And if we go out of here with just that, we're making a big mistake. We can tweak this and maneuver it around and everything else and end up with still a product that is so good for the state, it's unbelievable. Or we can just stick our head in the sand and say, and I hate to say this, but this, this is the truth now. I'm, I'm telling you the gospel fact. There are those in the capital right now that believe just this. If I could save you $50,000, $5,000 a year in tax savings, I'd write you a check for $5,000. And on the other hand, I would have, let's say this is my whole program. I'm going to say this young man $5,000, but i got to raise the tax on bubblegum up here. You've got a bunch of people that are going to say, by God, I'm not for it. By God, I'm not going to vote for a tax increase. Now that we can't do. We can't do. If we do that, we'll blow our legs off. Ask me something else, please. Yes, sir. 
So um, I like that this plan is proactive because I think that's what we need right now. We need proactive action, and I like that you're taking that. But I'm just wondering, why wouldn't you want to prefer to do something more analogous to what President Reagan did on a lesser scale? Like maybe something like Georgia, how Georgia isn't um, taxing energy for corporations. Or maybe something like giving a certain amount of tax money back to people who hire within our labor pool, since we have such a big untapped labor pool. You know, just to kind of ing ingratiate corporations to come in and manufacture for us. Well, uh, the answer is just really simple. And just think about this just a second. With the exception of Kansas, and who in the world wants to go to Kansas? First of all, they're a long ways away from everything. They don't have anything like what we got. They're nowhere close to the populations and everything else. But this works. That's the first thing. And the second thing is all the stuff that I let off by telling you, we've already done in West Virginia. All the kind of stuff you're talking about, we've tried and tried and tried, and it hadn't worked. It's just not worked. That's us right there. You know, the bottom line is we've got the cheapest property taxes in the land. We've got great, a great corporate taxes in the land. Do you realize in West Virginia, if you're a sub S corporation, there is no taxation. Tennessee hits you at three different levels. There's none. There's no taxation, and it flows right to the individual, and then they pay their taxes on. They still don't come. They don't come. This has the most sex appeal. This is the thing, the <coughs> thing that drives population to us. Now, you say, why haven't you done the other thing? I'll say it's a little. Not necessarily me. They have been done. And they don't come. Can I ask a further question? Yeah. So you think that in terms of the stimulus or something similar to this rebate, that would do more to driving manufacturing opposed to um, what I have talked about and kind of take our reliance off of fossil fuels? Like, do you think that will help achieve that? Because I think that's pretty dire. Well, hear me out on this. You know, I'm very, very proud of our fossil fuels. And, you know, now, you know they, they've made us in many, many ways, especially in southern West Virginia. And we should all be really passionately proud of who we are. But we do need to diversify. And, and, I, and, and I would tell you, just think about it. Today, since I've been there, the amount of revenue that we receive from our severance tax of our fossil fuels and everything is the lowest percentage it's <coughs> been in 25 years. And yet the state's thriving. You know, we do, do need to continue to diversify. And whether it be manufacturing or high tech or whether it be you know, medical or tourism or whatever it may be, absolutely, absolutely, we need to diversify. You know, but we don't need to forget those fossil fuels. And with all this, what I'm saying is, this is the stimulus that everybody has just been looking for. I just got to get, to get people to just open their eyes and just think just a second. Just think about what they could be missing. Because at the end of the day, here's, here's the whole thing. I'd say this to all y'all. You know, if this thing passes, I hate to say it, it's no skin off Jim Justice's notes. If all y'all own small businesses and everything else, absolutely, you are missing the greatest opportunity on the planet. On the planet. Now, how we tweak it and all that kind of stuff, you, you can't, honestly, the dress store downtown, the Walmart, Richard, everybody, you what you're having a problem? You're having a problem keeping chicken. Because they're going to come from everywhere wanting to buy. The dress store is going to have a problem keeping dresses in the store. That's what I want to have. And from the standpoint, let me say one last thing. From the standpoint of our unearned income, this gets a little complicated. But from the standpoint of our earned, earned income, I want that gone too. I don't want them to pay either. I want that gone too. I just can't get it gone on the first step. Now, because here's what will happen. The LLC, the sole proprietorship, the sub-S, this 
this gets a little bit complicated, but just hang right there. Those people, let's say I've got a sub S, let me be ridiculous and make my point. I've got a sub S company, and what a sub S does, all the earnings or losses flow right to me. And I fill out a tax return and I pay taxes on all the profits and all the losses come to me. Okay? Let's say I'm in Ohio and I'm making $10 million a year. $10 million a year. And we get rid of our state income tax. And in Ohio, let's say I'm paying 10%. I'm paying a million dollars a year in Ohio. You know what I can do? I can move my business right over here, bring my people and everything over here, and pay zero. What do you think they're going to do? They're going to come. That's going to bring job opportunities. It's going to bring everything here. I can move and pay zero. <coughs> it's not $300, even though $300 is significant. I am telling you, if we can get rid of the whole package, it'll drive opportunity to your life you can't imagine. Thank you, Governor Justice. Thank you, sir. Wait, did anybody else got anything? Yes, sir. Hi, I'm Mike Turner. I'm the general manager of Skyline. We're in uh, Gate, West Virginia. And my question to you is, the biggest resale, the biggest profit maker I have as a restaurant is my liquor, my beer, and my soft drinks. That's my margin. Right. By driving the price up to 39% on liquor, I'm going to have to raise my price on liquor. Right. So I have to go from selling shot at Jack Nash from 7 bucks to 10 bucks. Well, from five bucks to seven fifty-eight dollars. Most people will pay that because it's extremely high for a well and for Jack. But more importantly, it's going to affect how I pay my entertainment. Now I'm losing money because people, less people are going to buy drinks. Contrary to what you said, nobody's going to pay ten dollars for shot Jack. But now all the live music I book to bring attractions into my community to get more people involved, I'm not going to be able to afford to pay the bands. Tell me your first ever game. Mike. Mike. Okay. Mike, I'm just you. Okay. Uh, Mike, on, I think, on a fifth of Jack Daniels, mm -hmm. it's going to cost you $1.70. dollar seventy. A dollar seventy more. So I have to charge three, about four, ten more total on the on, 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 on and, and you, But you just said on a on a shot of Jack Daniels, yeah. you're going to change. You're going to change your price from seven to ten dollars. Yeah, I have to pay money. I have to pay for the things. How how in the world? How many, how many shots are in the fifth? I don't know. Twenty-four. Twenty-four. Well, Twenty-four. In, in this scenario, that's costing about uh, about seven to eight cents a shot. That's what it is. There no I'm to, I'm under, the, under, under the current tax law, it would be twenty-seven dollars and forty-eight cents per bottle. Under the proposal, it would be over twenty-nine dollars and nineteen cents per bottle, which will be a dollar seventy per bottle, Jack. And if you divide Jack. that by twenty-four, divide that by twenty. You're going to get an increase. And I can do it really quick. I can tell you exactly how the money. But that's why I'm saying. That. Now look, all of us, Mike and Jim, have absolutely gone through the wilderness. And felt like for certain, absolute, absolute. Hold on, what what was that? One more time. That is dollar seventy four, right? Dollar seventy divided by twenty four. Dollar seventy divided by twenty four. It's seven cents. It's going to raise. It's going to raise that drink to everybody that comes in. They're not three dollars. It's going to raise it seven cents, and you're the same the same place you are. Now, how did you calculate? Four eighty per down. On, on, on what did you say? Tax on soft drinks. On soft soft drinks are going to be five cents a can. I don't know. I'm just again. I'm worried about the gallon price. I don't sell cans. I sell drinks. Okay. okay. Well, I'll do what I'll tell you. My point is this: every one of us, and we had, we walked along and knew that that man right there was a bad man. And then all of a sudden later on in life, we realized, hold on, wait a minute, he's my best friend on the planet. And we realized things. You know, Mike really believed that he's going to have to charge his customers 
from seven to ten dollars, which is crazy. Now that's just not true. You may have to charge your customer if you want to make a little extra money. You can charge your customer seven twenty-five instead of seven dollars, and you can put some extra money in your pocket. But if you want to break even, charge your customer seven oh seven. Tell them what that is. On the salt drinks, it's uh, four dollars and eighty cents per gallon on the syrup. How much? How many soft drinks do you get out of a gallon of syrup? I mean, it's a lot. Yeah, I understand that. That's what that's what they use in the fountain drinks, yeah. right? The syrup. Well, and then, yes, Mike. Just yes. Depends on the mixture. And then on, on the dry mixture, it's six cents per twenty-eight point three five grams. You use the dry mixture or the syrup? The syrup. Yeah, the syrup. So. I don't know if anybody uses the dry mixture. Yeah, it's just. I'm not in the restaurant business, so I just leave that out there. But four dollars and eighty cents per gallon on the syrup. But I, I want you to know that I love that you're, you're you're in your business, and I love that you're here, that you're concerned, and, and I just want you to I just want you. To, well, I'm not the guy to talk about cutting. I'm the one. That's I moved right. up here to be a chef. Yep. You know, the food culture here is terrible. Hey. Just, you know, <laughs>
going to get next to a nothing check if you're not working. If you're working, that's when you're going to get the money from me. That's what I'm saying. If it's going to encourage people to work. Because all this is about working great. and getting more and more of your money back instead of just giving it to the government. Still, what on earth right does the government have to have your money? What right do they really have? That, this is about all working people. This is not paying somebody to stay home with a unemployment check or whatever. There's a lot of people that are hurting and everything. I got that. But, but this isn't that. This is working people. Yeah, but I mean, you just drive around here right now. I'm looking for people. McDonald's was oh, looking yeah, for sure. We're all looking for people. And, uh, but in addition to that, let me just comment on that. We're all looking for people, aren't we? We all are. You know? Well, let us just think about it. The reason we're looking for people is we don't have the population. We've got to find a way to get them here. We've got to find a way to get people that want to move here. That's what I'm talking about. Yeah, I get it. I'm there, bro. Can we just, just associate it with that, that topic? Um, so I work full time. I have a small child. I get subsidies for child care. I don't make enough money to pay for that. If I did, I'd have to pay $7,800 a year. The $1,400 you're promising me, because I work, would put me outside of that uh, program. But $1,400 will not pay $7,800 a year. So what I ask you to think about is while you're putting more money in my pocket, your programs, our state programs, are not built to continue to help me support my child and put her in daycare. Okay, now understand that $1,400 is an average of every. Sure. My point being, though, is that the systems, the social services systems, do not have steps, right? Any amount of money extra I make isn't going to be $7,800. It's not going to pay for my child care. But I will lose access to that support. So what I'm just, I'm just asking is that we consider a little bit more money in my pocket is detrimental to a program that's not built to help me keep going. It's meant to help me stop getting services at a certain rate. Does that make sense? It, it does, it, you know, but it, it is a subject that's not really this subject. It is more of a subject of social services and things that we really need to be trying to do and bless your little child. I mean, is it boy or girl? Uh, it's a girl. And if uh, minimum wage went up, I wouldn't have that problem. So it, it is. It is definitely related related to what you're talking about. I do have, I have okay. some good news here. I have some good news. Okay. It, it's not extra income. It's a reduction in your taxes. So your income will stay the same. Your retaxes on that income will go down. So, so when the program not, asks me what I make, I don't have to claim that $1,400 as part, part of the, the income that I have. It, yeah, it's not income. It's a reduction in taxes on the income that you have. Gotcha. That's fantastic. Thank you. Thank okay. you for clarifying. See how much I know. <laughs>